So this is uh, a, a headline that was very striking. You may have seen it in the, uh, it was in the financial pages of The Guardian. Uh, in the FTSE 100, there are more Johns than there are women. Uh, there are more uh, Daves than there are women. And actually, there's even more Knights than there are women. Now, in Australia, by comparison, it's Pete's. So whichever um, name you choose, uh, there are actually a uh, common name. There are more men with that name than, the, than there are all women. So it's a very um, stark uh, feature of the corporate world, but it applies equally to just about anything you look at. This is just a picture showing the distribution of um, women at different grades. This one's actually taken from the National Science Foundation in the States. And it just shows that when we start off at the bachelor's degree level, we're about 50-50. And as you get up through the ranks, up to full professors, we've dropped to about 20%. So this is, a, a, a as far as I'm concerned, a sort of single transferable graph. This is, what, um, this is what we see when we look at gender data in academia. So um, when you look at it in more detail, this is actually an American one here. And we see that over time, uh, at the uh, doctoral level, we've got up to around 50% over time, 50% uh, of doctorates are received by women. But interestingly enough, there is some variation in country. So that Lithuania actually has a very high number, uh, high proportion of women getting their PhDs. And countries that you uh, kind of think are uh, very uh, gender equal, such as the Netherlands, are very much not so. And actually, the Netherlands is one of the least uh, equal countries. And the former um, Eastern Europe is often uh, quite a lot better. Uh, better means having equal numbers of men and women. And uh, in my own former university, Queens, you could see a similar thing. We've got uh, about equal numbers of PhD. Uh, students, male and female. Now, the pattern that I showed there in the coloured graph from the National Science Foundation, it doesn't really matter where you get your data <coughs> from, you'll actually see the same pattern. So this is in Queen's University of Belfast, it's the institutional submission, undergraduate across school and um, set school, science, engineering and technology. So undergraduates, it's about 50-50, uh, females in the darker bar. Uh, postgraduate talk, we actually get slightly more women than men. Uh, postgraduate research, it's very close to 50-50. Research assistants, still quite equal, lecturers still quite equal. And then it's at the promoted levels that it starts dropping. And we can also look at this. This is from uh, the uh, bronze institutional submission from Bournemouth University. I just borrowed one of our graphs. It hasn't, it's not gone fully public yet because we haven't, um, we haven't got our feedback, but I think you wouldn't mind me giving just one data. So if we um, just look at the dashed lines, which is the percentage female, and we, uh, the 50% line is that one, just on the arrow. So at uh, the lower grades of staff, we're above um, 50%. By the time we get to uh, grade 8 drop, uh, to grade 9, we're just dropping below the 50. And then by the time we get to grade 11 and 12, you're down to about 20% uh, female. So it's just the same patterns you get everywhere. The slight rise at grade 12 plus is an anomaly caused by uh, small amounts of data. There aren't very many people at that. So this is the pattern we see. Um, and so why do we see that pattern? Why, why do we end up with uh, fewer me uh, women than men. And uh, one of the ideas is uh, role models. Women look at the academic careers. They don't see themselves there, particularly not at senior levels. Uh, so role models is one of them. But very interesting, if we just take the biology line at the top, for example, here, 45% of PhDs, this is an American one, years 99 to 2003, 45% of biology PhDs are female, 26% of applicants for academic jobs are female. By the time you get up to interview, there's 28%. And 
and the first job office that went to women was 34%. So when women actually apply for the jobs, um, they get them. So that is the, frequently the main goal, is to actually get women to apply. Um, and <coughs> I'm not pointing this in the wrong direction. Um, and it, this is uh, data from Queens. And if we look at um, the percentage of female applications and the percentage of female appointments, the open bars are applications, the closed and filled bars are appointments. So most of the time, we see more women, a higher proportion of women appointed than actually apply. Not in that year. Sometimes numbers are quite low, um, but uh, it's it's genuine, genuine, generally the case that um, when women apply, they are actually more likely to be appointed. And this is found that in completely independent situations, such as um, the School of Biological Sciences in Queens and that large American survey which actually I have to say I was quite pleased to see the results of the American survey because I had been slightly wondering whether it might actually be something to do with me and I had been um, pushing things a bit too far. Not unconscious bias, but actually conscious bias. Not anti-male, of course, but just making clear that everything was taken into account when a woman was being interviewed. So um, why don't women apply? Why are they fewer? In, uh, in applications than men, why are they dropping out as we go from PhD to lectureship and upwards? Well, this survey uh, from, again, from the United States is that really it's about babies and by no means everything that we're talking about in employing women is about babies, certainly not. But uh, on average, um, when you survey a broad range of people, babies are what it comes down to. So, um, quotation from Wendy Williams and Cornell, plan to have children in the future, or already having them is responsible for an enormous drop-off in the women who apply for the tenure track jobs. And if we look at this, um, so that we're looking at uh, postdocs who have decided against careers. So, when there are no children, men, yellow, women, red, both of them are on about 20%. They have decided against having or trying to have a career in science. Uh, <coughs> then, if we think about having no children but actually you'd like to have them, uh, at this stage we see a gap opening up. So, for, for men, it makes no difference at all. In fact, it makes them slightly more likely to want to have an academic career that they do want to have a baby. But for women, we're seeing a big, um, a big difference now. The merely wanting to have a baby stops you thinking about a career. If you've already got one, uh, it makes it even less likely for women to want a career in science. And if they've had a child since they got a postdoc, um, they're now down to 40% of women are saying, I don't want an academic job if, I'm, if I've got a baby. So uh, to sort of work against this, uh, Otteline Laser, who some of you may know, uh, produced this wonderful book called Mothers in Science. And it is called uh, 64 Ways to Have It All. And it's a picture of people's lives and how they manage to have babies, win their Nobel Prizes, get their FRSs and all that kind of stuff. And I find it absolutely heartwarming and lovely. Other people may find it a little bit sickening because they do actually, the women they've chosen are not everyday run-of-the-mill female academics. They are the elite, the ones who've really done incredibly well. And of those mothers, um, 64 ways to have it all, one of them is coming here tomorrow, that's Jane Hill. Um, and now I'm going to change on to a slightly different topic, uh, but uh, with obviously the same theme, and that's the data. And I met at uh, a psychological meeting in America, I met Kim Sullivan from Utah State University. And she had had a funded project from the NSF looking at societies, meaning um, scientific societies. And um, it, the societies that she was interested in were ones that are in ornithology. That's the study of birds, as in that pretty one down there. And so um, she carried out research in using uh, membership directories um, and all kinds of other evidence that they had. And interestingly enough, in the uh, ornithology 
Strategies Societies, they have, a, they have a group newsletter called The Flock. So The Flock had evidence, had the, all the names of all of the society members from 1979 to 2004. So she was able to actually look at individual student members, when they joined, and how they fared as members of the society. So it's a really um, very nice piece of work. You couldn't always do this. But um, she's used this to, uh, to come through with the idea about how important data is. So what she found was that um, if we look at these, um, if it, it's like a, a, a life table, survival graph. If you look at females versus males on the, on the right-hand side, if these are people who were recruited in, in particular years. We take the pink line on both sides, which is the year 1982. <coughs> so they started off in year naught, and of course there's 100% of the members because that's the year they joined. For men, by the time we get to um, year six, we've got about 54% of the uh, men who joined in this year are still members of those societies. But if we look at women, by the time we got to uh, year six, uh, they, sorry, I said the wrong around, the, 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 the females are down to, um, in year six, they're down to 54%. But if you compare males, they're 68%. And the same goes for all of it. The, the graph shape, as you can see, is much uh, lower down. So women are leaving um, the science societies, the ornithology societies. And this was something... It had not really been appreciated until she started analysing it. So once they started realising this, um, she presented the data to the societies and they realised that if they didn't do something about this, it wasn't going to be just an old boys club, it was going to be an old man's society because all the females would have dropped out. So um, she analysed the data, showed them and they, they did take some steps to do things. But she also did some very interesting interviews. And what she found was that actually women were more likely to change career when their partner was in the same field. So uh, female ornithologists, the pale blue here, 70% of them were going to not be ornithologists anymore if their partner was in the same area. And in terms of numbers of jobs applied for, uh, women with partners applied on average for fewer jobs than uh, men, and uh, more. Um, sorry, and much. Once they got partners, they were less likely to apply for jobs altogether. So this is something which I think most uh, people in the room will be familiar with. Uh, you once you've actually got a partner, you you try to. You try to balance your needs in your career with your partner's needs and career. And in many cases, what has happened here is that the female ornithologists have decided that actually they'll go for a different career, maybe in support services or something like that, in order to allow uh, their male partner to pursue his absolute love of studying birds. Um, so what happened to the female students? Well, as the job market became more competitive, uh, fewer of the women transitioned to long-term members. Uh, because the women often did have partners in the same field, they accommodated their partners' careers. And so they uh, tended to drop out of this. And Kim, having done this analysis, she gave some slightly humorous uh, um, advice to the graduate students. Uh, develop quantitative skills, consider non-academic positions, apply for lots of jobs, date outside your graduate program so you didn't end up in um, the same field as your partner. And of course, if you want children, don't wait too long. But um, although the, the advice was humorous, I think because this was, uh, this was a survey done quite widely and it's kind of because it's funded by the NSF, it's got some sort of authority or... Um, you, you, it's not just anecdotal, let's say. So I thought it was very interesting. Uh, now I'm going to bring in um, uh, Athena Swan and what it's about. Now, most of you will know something about it, maybe in some cases actually quite a lot at this stage through the Women's Academic Network in this university and so on. But the idea is to advance women in uh, STEM 
with the M now representing medicine, the M on the end. And because it's funded by the Equality Challenge Unit, uh, they give a lot of very good advice as to what to do, but also it's supported by many societies such as the Royal Society and the Biochemical Society. And a really, really important step, critically important step, was in 2011 when the Chief Medical Officer, Sally Davis, announced that the NIHR funding would only be available when a medical school holds a silver award. Now, medicine, of all the areas that show a little bit of gender equal inequality, medicine is the most outrageous. And so this was a really, really major step, and she knew exactly what she was doing. Um, the Research Councils UK may follow this. Certainly, it will help to improve ref environment scores and such like. Uh, and the Loughborough University did an independent evaluation into the impact and effectiveness of the charter, which confirmed that the award scheme does advance gender equality, changes working culture and attitude within participating departments and universities. So the, um, in my abstract for this talk, I slightly cheekily referred to vice chancellors and um, their interest in receiving prizes and medals. But I thought that was my own uh, interpretation of what had happened until I was at a talk by Jocelyn Bell Burnell, who is um, an extremely distinguished astrophysicist. Um, she had the discoveries, she discovered um, radio pulsars, and she uh, worked on a Nobel Prize winning discovery of this. And uh, she was in the very beginning of the people developing SWAN, it was basically her idea, and actually the prizes and awards were aimed at specifically vice chancellors because vice chancellors like to get awards. Of course, it's nice to have a photo of yourself doing something nice. So um, it, it was actually, uh, it's genuinely the reason. So there's, it's, there's two strands going on all the time. One of the strands is we, we have to meet the needs that will actually get the prize, if you call it that, award. But of course, there's a reality too, which is about the culture and about making things better for women. But don't ignore the prize side of it. And uh, this is a picture from Queen's where our Vice Chancellor, Peter Gregson, there is in the middle. And yes, I have a very poorly chosen jacket. I took it out of my wardrobe, not thinking what it would actually look like in a photograph. It looks like I'm wearing a chain. Um, and the, uh, on the right there is Professor Patrick Johnson, who was head of medicine, which got the silver award at the same time as we got the gold. And he now is um, vice chancellor of Queen's. So we, uh, we, we please our vice chancellors. And I totted up how many times uh, we got imaged on his leaving uh, photographs, and it was a lot. So it's, it is important. Uh, it's very, very, very important to get buy-in from the top. And that's why it's very nice to see both Tim and John here uh, showing that they are with us in trying to improve gender equality in this university. Um, so there are, the point about analysing data, yeah, I hadn't told you about that, I was going to put this up. Um, the, the, uh, the point about um, SWAN is it is data-based. It is data. Data are what allow us to identify the problems. And so it is about rationality. And what we've actually found is that once all the data were analysed properly, um, the percentage of women submitted to work in Bournemouth was just around 20 and the percentage of men submitted to the REF 2014 in Bournemouth was uh, just nearly double that. So there is a gender inequality, and that doesn't mean um, curtains to submitting for the Bronze Award, but what it does mean is that we've got to find out what this is about. So uh, it needs, this needs to be understood, and the action plan that Tian Tian wrote has got, and James, has got a lot of elements in it to address what, what this is actually about. So there's lots of things that can be done, but first of all is actually understanding the data, what does this mean, but once you have uh, done that, then you can put measures in place such as more mentoring 
And these are the things that are already going on, the writing workshops, I mean, writing retreats. Clearly, I've heard about these from several people. It's a really great thing. Um, encourage your confidence. Now, um, we know that women can very quickly lose confidence, uh, seemingly more than men, and it's about encouraging people to say, of course, your research is good enough, and helping them when, the, when needed. Uh, workload allocation models um, is something very significant because it is possible for a gender imbalance to have developed in workloads without anyone noticing. Of course, it's not done deliberately, but if some people are more likely to say yes to doing a job and some people are more likely to say no, it may be that certain people end up with more of certain types of job. But I have to say it is also possible that there was some biased selection of people for REF by gender, and I don't mean conscious, of course not, but unconscious bias we now know is absolutely pervasive, it applies to all of us, and there are unconscious bias um, training sessions going on this week, which um, I hope to attend. Uh, really, it's something which you have, to, um, you have to understand, and it's not suggesting that there's anything wrong with any bias that did happen due to unconscious bias. It happens. Um, so the ECU, the Equality Challenge Unit, uh, recommend an image audit. And the images that I'm just going to illustrate here are where you have a newsletter. And I've mentioned this to a couple of the people in departments who are run, planning to run for the uh, departmental submission. The, the image audit means that you ensure that there are always women shown. And as a manager or leader, what I would say is you've got multiple goals. You've got to bring in research money. You've got to publish. You've got to keep the teaching running. You've got to try to stop squabbles developing, all the kinds of things that, that you do. But at, at the same time as doing all of these things, you just keep in part of your mind uh, the gender aspect of it. So. Um, there, here's the um, prize winners. These are all images from actually my last issue of the magazine. And so th these are uh, female uh, postgraduate prize winners. Um, here's uh, a, a talk to schools. And I know you have plenty of women and young women coming in for your schools. And that's my uh, former director of education there, who's um, delighted to say just been appointed to the um, head of the school in uh, University of Brighton. So he's only going to be a few hours away from me now. So uh, there's young women, um, things that show that it's family friendly. Um, I know you, you've got the great advantage here of actually having a crash on campus. So it should be really easy to get lots of pictures of uh, really junior people around. So the top picture there is uh, my former colleague, Sheena, who surprisingly ended up with twins and, and actually led to her leaving Queens. But anyway, I uh, well, didn't hold that against her. Here's her lovely babies, here's her charming husband. And so we celebrated that and then um, a postgraduate uh, mentoring event below there. Uh, men, women, together. And then you can take um, very deliberate steps to ensure that seminars you get the most distinguished women you can get. Now, most, of, most senior women who've achieved a great deal are really only too pleased to come and to share their experiences like Jocelyn Bell Burnell, and it can be really inspiring to have these people. So uh, this just so happened that in the space of seven days, I got uh, three women, Lynn Rothschild from NASA, uh, the woman who's the president of the British uh, Phys uh, Biophysical Society, and she is, I think she's an FRS. Uh, and then on the right, we have a field scientist from Madagascar, uh, who's just won a prize as well. So making sure that you not only have the right images up and around, but that you do bring uh, the best women. And, and of course, there's plenty of men coming too. It's, it just happened that that was a, a week with three women. More images, if there's action pictures, make sure some of those people in the action are the women. Um, this is quite funny here, because of course, he's just spraying, but she's driving the quad bike, you know. I didn't take that picture. 
Um, ref, actually, one of the interesting things, that is the ref... Um, this is my panel chair, Mark Price, who is the... Uh, he's deputy vice-chancellor in UCL, and this is the deputy... Uh, panel chair who's actually pres uh, runs Darwin College in Cambridge, but there was a distinct gender by uh, lack of women in our ref panel. It may be because it was earth and environment, but it, it just so happened that the four women who were on the panel, we did tend to uh, slightly block vote on things. Sounds like the Eurovision written song contest. Um, uh, more, gender, uh, more image stuff, and this is the cop that I told you I was going to show. This is uh, <laughs> Gillespie. She's the, um, she was the Deputy Chief Constable of Northern Ireland, and when she described what she had had to get through to get that position, it's absolutely amazing. Uh, uh, the middle, of course, is uh, Peter Gregson again, and the right was the, the chair of our um, Senate. So Judith, um, in order to become a top cop, you have to actually spend um, six months in England. So she had spent six months away from her children in England when they were quite young and her husband had, had picked up the slack. Um, more um, image stuff, just even in the background of a lab, make sure there's females there as well, when the senior people, and actually on the top right is our L'Oreal uh, woman in Science uh, Award. She was the L'Oreal Woman for Thailand. And when I was telling our marketing department about this, uh, the guy from marketing said, oh, I suppose she must be good looking. I said, what do you mean? He said, well, you know, she's won the L'Oreal Award. I said, no, actually, this is the L'Oreal Award for Science. Um, but it turned out she's actually very good looking. So that... <laughs> So she did end up being photographed quite a lot. Um, oh, that's the second one. Um, and I'm just going to finish on something which is quite, uh, well, to me, quite funny, but uh, also uh, we do need to think about these things that can happen. And this is about promotions. Uh, in NUI Galway, uh, this is Micheline Sheehy Skeffington. She, is, uh, she has a very well-known name in Ireland because her grandmother was a suffragette and her grandfather was shot in the Civil War. But she actually started in NUI Galway just at the same time as me. So she took, um, she took her university to court uh, for discrimination in not promoting her. Women know why she took the case. Men don't get it, she says. And um, the Equality Tribunal described NUIG's promotion processes as ramshackle. The most significant frailty uh, uh, is the statistical evidence. There had been 132 applications for the post, 97 men and 35 women. Uh, 50 out of 97 men had been successful, so about half. 11 out of 35 women, so less than a third. It's clear that male applicants have a one in two chance of being promoted to SL, while women who apply have a less than one in three chance. And amazingly enough, having examined this evidence, the tribunal ordered NUI Galway to promote uh, Michelin to uh, senior lecturer from July 2009, even though she was actually retired, pay her the full salary difference and to award her a tax-free tax 70,000 euro. So the university was also ordered to review its policies and procedures in relation to promotion to senior lecturer to make sure they're in compliance with these acts with particular reference to the gender gram. So uh, I, I finish on that because it, this is why it's essential to always monitor your data. We actually have analysed the promotions data and we know what it is. I won't say too much at this stage until it goes public. But when you are a member of uh, Swan Athena and when you analyse your data routinely, such a thing as happened in NUI Galway can't happen because they would have known that. They would have known that that couldn't happen just by chance and they would have put uh, measures in place to deal with it. So I think I'm ending on that to, to, to show the benefits to the institution of regularly examining your data and uh, also bringing in things like the workload allocation model, which a Swan Athena will require. Okay, thank you. <laughs>